Hello, I'm Daisy Cousins. Welcome to This Week in Social Justice. This week's biggest and baddest social justice fails include tennis star Naomi Osaka's Black Lives Matter activism and why it's completely misplaced, why J.K. Rowling's latest novel has trans activists all in a tizzy, and depending on how long I feel like talking about the first two topics, we may even have time for a bonus topic. So let's get started. But while I have your attention, make sure you subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, turn on those notifications, and above all else, please share this video. YouTube deliberately squashes content from independent commentators in favor of mainstream news outlets like CNN, especially if those independent commentators are conservative. It would be hugely helpful and very, very much appreciated if you can help me bypass that a bit by sharing this video. I would be so grateful to you if you could do that for me. Tennis star Naomi Osaka has blurred the line between professional tennis and social justice by engaging in relentless performative Black Lives Matter activism since the resumption of the tennis season after COVID-19 in August. You will most likely remember Naomi Osaka from 2018 when she beat Serena Williams in the final of the US Open despite Serena's tantrum about how the umpire was sexist for punishing her for breaking the rules. Now, Naomi did an admirable job of battling through several instances of Serena being a complete brat and also an unbelievably hostile crowd to win that match. And she certainly gained a lot of fans from her good sportsmanship and down-to-earth, humble, non-political approach to things. However, all of that has been thrown out the window recently because Naomi, who is part Haitian, part Japanese and grew up in New York, decided she was going to use her return to the court to opine about Black Lives Matter. Now, while Naomi has been vocal on social media about Black Lives Matter for a few months now, it started bigly on August 26th after Naomi had made it to the semi-finals of the Western and Southern Open, the tournament that just preceded the US Open. Out of the blue, Naomi refused to play her semi-final match and posted a message of intent on Twitter, which stated, Hello. As many of you are aware, I was scheduled to play my semi-final match tomorrow. However, before I am an athlete, I am a black woman. And as a black woman, I feel there are much more important matters at hand that need immediate attention rather than watching me play tennis. I don't expect anything drastic to happen with me not playing, but if I can get a conversation started in a majority white sport, I consider that a step in the right direction. Watching the continued genocide of black people at the hand of the police is honestly making me sick to my stomach. I'm exhausted of having a new hashtag pop up every few days, and I'm extremely tired of having this same conversation over and over again. When will it ever be enough? Ugh, this goes on for 12 more minutes. Anyway, as it turned out, something rather drastic did happen. Because of her boycott, the tournament decided to suspend a whole day of play in a protest against racial injustice. Timing-wise, this was soon after the police shooting, shooting of Jacob Blake, by the way. Anyway, because of the tournament suspension, Naomi agreed to play her semi-final match, which she won, but unfortunately she had to pull out of the final because of a hamstring injury. Lucky for her, that time off must have worked because she did come back the very next week to win the US Open. However, evidently she had got a bit of a taste for activism because her Black Lives Matter advocacy did not stop with the boycott. For every match she played at the US Open, all seven of them, she walked onto the court wearing a mask with the name of a different black victim of police violence written on it. Here's what she had to say about it at the awards ceremony. The point is to make people start talking. Okay, I don't know where she's been recently, but if she thinks that people aren't talking about Black Lives Matter, considering everything that has happened since the death of George Floyd, then she must be living on a planet of her own creation. But wait, there's more. For me, I, I've been inside of the bubble, so I'm not really sure what's really going on in the outside world. All I can tell is what's going on on social media. And Yep, clearly in the bubble. So, there are two things that really annoy me about this whole situation. 
The first is that tennis is obviously losing its political impartiality. Now as a lot of you know, I'm a massive tennis fan. I follow it religiously. And one of the things I have loved about the tennis world and tennis players is that they haven't succumbed to the pressure or the temptation to mix politics in with their profession. And why would they? They're athletes and politics is not in that job description. While of course it is up to them whether they want to speak publicly on political and world issues, free speech, their public profiles are bound up in tennis, not politics. And until recently this seemed to be the standard that a lot of them held. But it seems that things are changing, with other players like Sloane Stephens and Milos Raonic publicly pra praising Naomi's behaviour. All of which annoys me to tears, because like so many other people, I watch tennis to escape politics. Not to have it chucked in my face by people who do not know what they're talking about. And indeed, Naomi doesn't know what she's talking about. Which brings me to the second reason that this whole thing annoys me. You'll notice that Naomi's Twitter statement used the word genocide. She said it was a continued genocide of black people at the hand of the police. Now, genocide means, according to Britannica, the deliberate and systemic destruction of a group of people because of their ethnicity, nationality, religion, or race. That is, it refers to a large ethnic or religious group. Certainly, Naomi Osaka, and really everyone advocating for Black Lives Matter, paints the police killing of unarmed black people as a kind of epidemic sweeping the USA. The way they talk about it, you'd think that thousands or even millions of black people were killed by specifically white and male police officers every year. But the numbers are in on that, and that's simply not the case. I'm going to show you a clip that the very excellent Brandon Straka, founder of the Walk Away campaign, put together after he attended a Black Lives Matter protest. Just watch and carefully read the statistics rolling at the bottom of the screen as they're presented. They are sourced from the Washington Post database of police shootings. But you don't have any information. <laughs> You're the least educated people here. Really? Yes. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, let's go. Let's do it. Let's dance. All right. All right. Let's talk statistics because black li black people are being killed by police, right? Yes. What are the numbers? What are the numbers? What? I don't need to tell you the numbers. I need you. Okay. I need you. You don't know any. Understand your privilege <laughs> and the fact that your skin color does not get you killed. Okay, can we talk about statistics and numbers and data and yeah. facts and evidence? Right. Wait, wait, wait. What are the numbers? What are the numbers? Yeah, what are the numbers right. for you guys? Hold on, hold on. Right. No, 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 no. What are the numbers? I'm going to tell you. Okay. The number of unarmed black people who were killed by police last year was nine. That's point zero 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 two two percent of the entire black population. The number of white people who were killed by the unarmed white people killed by the police last year was 19. 19. So, and the number of white people who are killed by police every year is double the amount that's killed by black people every. Because the facts that I'm giving you don't align with your your cult narrative. What is it about me that disgusts you? You're angry because I told you facts. Privilege. That's what I tell her. Yeah, we have yeah, a, yeah. Yes. Do you not understand self right now? Yeah. No, I'm an ally. I'm a f***ing ally because I believe... An ally to what? It's okay. To equality. To equality and justice. Right, but I just gave you the numbers, which show that the thing that you're angry about isn't real. So, as you can see, this is not an epidemic, or a genocide, or anything of the sort. And while nine fatal shootings of unarmed black people by cops is still too high, way too high, that number should be zero, Naomi's activism is, pa is based on a false premise. A dangerous false premise that is the genesis for the racial tensions and riots that are currently sweeping the USA. And the thing is, even when you add police killings of unarmed black people by means other than guns, like beatings, tasering, and vehicles, according to Mapping Police Violence, which is a crowdfunded database, that number is still only 25. Again, 25 is too many, it should be zero, but it is nothing like what Naomi Osaka and the Black Lives Matter crowd painted out to be. Now we can assume here that Naomi, just like the little activists in Brandon's video, simply has not looked up the facts. I mean, after all, she admitted in her speech that she's stuck in the social media bubble where echo chambers are created and nobody would be presenting her with any new information or even encouraging her to look up the stats for herself. But the higher ups within Black Lives Matter would absolutely know the truth of the situation and yet they keep on with this Marxist, anti-capitalist and at times violent campaign, lumping in clueless celebrities with big platforms like Naomi as they go. Massive social justice fail to Naomi, no Osaka and everyone who fed into her behaviour on this one. Harry 
Potter author J.K. Rowling has once more drawn the ire of litigious trans activists and the work brigade at large, but not for the reasons she usually does. Now, as we know, Rowling has made several comments on Twitter opposing self-identification and gender-neutral spaces and reminding people that biological sex is, in fact, a real thing. None of which are particularly radical positions to have, nor are they hateful positions to hold, and she has said many times that she loves and supports trans people and would oppose any discrimination that they faced. Nevertheless, she has been subject to some of the most outrageous hysterical abuse from the massively tolerant, totally not misogynistic left that I have ever seen on the internet. They have tried to cancel her so many times, and each time she has bounced back because, you know, Radical progressives are a noisy but generally tiny group of people comparatively who really literally spend their entire lives on Twitter and don't talk to normal people. However, this time around, it's not a Twitter post or personal essay that has incensed the woke crowd so vehemently. J.K. Rowling's latest novel has just been released. It is part of the strike crime mystery series that she writes under the nom de plume Robert Galbraith, and like all murder mysteries, there is, of course, a murderer. Now, in this particular novel, entitled Troubled Blood, the murderer has been perceived to be, from a couple of reviews that came out, a male serial killer who cross-dresses as a woman and targets specifically women. It seemed to start with a review from the Daily Telegraph, which went sort of viral, that said that the moral of the book seems to be never trust a man in a dress. Then, of course, Pink News picked it up and off it went. Now, the reaction from the Twitterati is, of course, as you'd imagine. You know, screaming, screaming lefties crying about her alleged transphobia and saying she's a white supremacist and so hateful and how she should die a horrible death, the usual. And actually, hashtag RIP JK Rowling was trending on Twitter, which is absolutely horrifying to think that a lot of people willfully pushed that hashtag about a human being, but you know, that was how I found out about the whole thing. Now, you can certainly imagine my shock when I saw hashtag RIP JK Rowling trending, but fortunately it seemed that Twitter anticipated people's shock and made sure to include a disclaimer under the trending hashtag, which read, no, JK Rowling is not dead. But as it turns out, as usual, all this outrage was based on a false premise. You see, the serial killer in the book isn't actually a cross-dresser by habit. According to The Spectator, it amounts to this. On page 75, Strike is listening to the son of an investigating officer tell him what he knows about Creed the murderer. He had his failures, you know. Penny Hiskett, she got away from him and gave the police a description in 71, but that didn't help them much. She said he was dark and stocky because he was wearing a wig at the time and all padded out in a woman's coat. They caught him in the end because of Melody Bauer, nightclub singer, looked like Diana Ross. Creed got chatting to her at the bus stop, offered her a lift, then tried to drag her into the van when she said no. She escaped, gave the police a proper description, and told them he'd said his house was of Paradise Park. That's it. A novelist uses a passing detail to explain how a murderer got close to one of his victims, for presumably the victim who gave the police a proper description did not see him in a woman's coat and wig. A critic, unintentionally or not, whips up a rage and thousands allow themselves to be whipped. Pavlov's dogs showed more critical independence. That article was written by Nick Cohen, who, of course, has actually read the 900-page book. And again, of course, all of those yelling about J.K. Rowling on Twitter have not read the book and never will. And the funny thing is that even if the serial killer in this book was habitually a cross-dresser or transvestite and kills women, that doesn't actually make him trans, even though all the activists were yelling that this is transphobic. This is a biological man who they thought dressed as a woman and kills women, but that is transvestite, not transgender. And honestly, it's very offensive and indeed transphobic to lump trans people in with transvestites. I mean, that's literally the stereotype that trans women have been fighting against for decades, you know, being labeled just cross-dressers. Gosh, I love it when people who try to be woke to impress their friends actually fail so hard because they actually don't understand woke concepts. Anyway, obviously this is a massive fail for all those horrible activists on Twitter who will use any opportunity to attack JK Rowling, even if it's a small review of a 900 page book that they have not read. It is insidious and very disturbing that these people get such a kick out of being so horribly mean and vicious to someone that they have never met. 
bonus topic. We have a bonus topic this week. So this doesn't actually have anything to do with social justice, but a literal UFO was spotted in New Jersey the other day. Oh my God. No puedo creer. Mira, he tenido que parar aquí en la, ¿cómo se llama? En la pista. No, look at that. Look at everybody in the highway right now. <laughs> I don't know, bro. Now, apparently, according to a few people who are actually determined to spoil everything fun, it was actually the Goodyear blimp. All of which is really kind of a testament to 2020. You know, you think it's going to be the most amazing thing ever because, you know, new decade, start of the roaring 20s, etc. And it ends up being the literal equivalent of the Goodyear blimp. But look, look at it this way. The Goodyear blimp might be disappointing and bland, but it does somehow manage to stay afloat, regardless of how wild the weather. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment. And if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me. Mm -hmm.